All right, and we're off. So we are here at another episode of the Developing Communities podcast. As always, I am joined by Alexander, and today we have a fantastic guest with us, which is Rain Leander. So thank you for joining us here, Rain. Uh, maybe we can start by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you've been up to. Yeah, um, I'm Rain Leander. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Um, yeah, I have an undergrad in dance and a master's in IT, and that says a lot about who I am left, right. Uh, I am currently at Cockroach Labs on week three. So you might say I've been adventuring quite a bit, uh, you know, because it's not like there's a pandemic going on. So <laughs> why not switch jobs a few times over the past year and a half? Um, but I'm loving it. I am a technical evangelist is my official title and I'm loving it. It's basically a developer advocate uh, with an emphasis on traveling and speaking and and listening. I actually don't like this title because I feel like the evangelist has one religious Im implications uh, that are not are not me. Others are welcome to be religious. It's not my gig. Uh, but also, evangelism implies that I'm not here to listen for you, and and I'm I'm definitely I'm a listener. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's such an interesting. Uh, go, go for it, Alexander. I, I know that you're talking. Sorry, I, I was about to ask. Did you find a, a better suited name uh, for your role then? I I am I am very keen on developer advocate. It's one of my favorites. It's the advocacy part of it that, to me, fits exactly because I not only advocate on behalf of the company to the community, but I find out what the community needs and I advocate on behalf of the community to the company. And I feel like that dialogue has to happen. And within developer relations, that is the most, that's that's the most important for me, is that communication. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting in what you say. My official title, uh, although I, I always say developer advocate, is a developer evangelist. And I changed my LinkedIn uh, title to developer evangelist. And I got a, a bunch of uh, really strange messages <laughs> coming in. That <laughs> So I decided just to stick to the developer advocate. It, yeah. What you say is really interesting because the, the way that you describe it, this advocacy uh, role when you do it, is that you know it it, it sounds like your uh, your like your clients is the developers, and you know you're not necessarily working for the company. You're trying to influence the company to be yeah. in line with what you know the, your clients and developers, the community uh, is after. Would you say that that's that's kind of accurate? It, it is it is more accurate to say that I have to remain impartial and neither neither have the company nor the developer nor the product as my client and yet have equal and and yet those are my three clients. So the product is just as important or mm -hmm. the project as the community and the company. Um, I will say I've never had a time, touch wood, where the company and or the product and or the community were in complete disagreement. And one of the reasons is that you make sure that the company is as transparent as possible, the project or the product is as transparent as possible, and the community knows what's going on and is also as transparent as possible. That's that's why I prefer working in open source. Because mm. that is, is inherent. Go ahead, Alex. Sorry. Is there other time when your focus went too much into either the product, either the company mm -hmm. branding, or either into advocating for your, your community? Uh, and if so, how do you do you have some tools or some ways to maintain that balance uh, or have warnings when you lose a uh, site? Um, well, I, I 
I wouldn't say that I have gone too far to one say, side or the other, but I will say that um, there was a time once where there was movement that was happening within the community. This was uh, this was three years ago. And uh, one of the projects within OpenStack, Triple O, was not going to be ready for the release. Um, and I assumed, <laughs> so that's the, that's that was my my bad. That the engineering group of Triple O understood that that was late because it was simultaneous. This was within Red Hat, where you have the product and the project and the engineering and upstream very close to one another, and so so effectively, I assumed that that communication was happening between engineering and management and it wasn't so when the release date came and triple o was late um one of the people that they were like did you see this coming was me i was one of the i was the community stakeholder i saw this coming and i had assumed that management knew. And so from then on, I assumed nothing mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and just made sure that the information was written down and the key stakeholders were always informed, um, no matter what. Um, I found that it doesn't really come down to a tool as much as a, a mindset. So making sure that you're constantly transparent and that you are constantly documenting and getting that information out there so that uh, your stakeholders are informed. Now, figuring out your stakeholders, that can be more difficult, um, but that's really about talking to everyone as much like getting everyone's input. And then so you're not bike shedding, making decisions maybe in spite of people's preferences or with inspired by people's preferences. But ultimately you have to make the decisions and go with the consequences, right? <laughs> I, I, I've had a similar experience. I think uh, uh, in my company, they've been, uh, uh, especially in a role when you connect a lot, the business, the community and, uh, and the product, you tend to mm -hmm. audience a lot of information and assume naturally that everybody has access to the same information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and then um, so we took all upon to give a, to warn upon warn to give everybody the rule of having the responsibility of sharing information of putting information back on the table even if it's repeating it for some people yeah because that yeah. flow of information is key to the success and especially uh, well younger companies it's critical to the success yeah yeah it's Definitely. it's interesting. It's interesting, one of the things that uh, recently GitGuardian decided to implement was making uh, the, the roadmaps and uh, all the kind of timelines public, which which was, uh, yeah, and I think, you know, it's still developing in terms of, you know, how this is set up. So, you know, not everything is, is, is as transparent as I think it will be down the track, but that was a really interesting approach uh, to me. And so then, because when people are asking for different features of when they're going to become available, you know, it it can feel like everything is like, oh, it's in the pipeline. It's like this magical mystery box, the pipeline. Yeah, it's in the pipeline. Like, what does that mean? It's, it's <laughs> down the road. So one of the things I really, really I love is making that pipeline public and then also implementing a feature request system that the public can vote on and see. Mm -hmm. So, so you might have something like, um, oh, what was what was the the particular the Equinix Metal had a particular uh, tool for this that was public facing. It was for feature requests, and then anyone inside the company or outside the company could see and then vote on those feature requests. And therefore, if you had a bunch of people who really wanted that data center in Sao Paulo, then it would get a lot of votes and it would happen accordingly. Like it was, it was, uh, it made it more obvious. And then if you had a feature that was pushed up to the top, 
you would need to explain why, you know, oh, well, this is because we have a couple of key customers maybe that are mm. putting more resources towards it, for example. Mm. Um, but it, it, yeah, when you have transparency, it makes a lot of things so much easier. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. And it, it's such an obvious thing when you when you think or you want to know what your users, mm -hmm. what, the, what the stakeholders uh, want. But uh, sometimes I think we're, cut, we're starting to come out of a culture of kind of secrecy in, in this and, and get more transparency as open source becomes more popular. But yeah. it, it really puts you out of your comfort zone because you have to own that, that roadmap, uh, you know, to say we're going to deliver and we're going to yeah. try to, to meet the, the dates or the, the timeline we promise you to. Uh, and that's scary. That's scary for everybody, for, for CEO and product team and, and marketing. Or, or, I mean, and, and I'm curious because I haven't done that. I think we're tending towards this in, our, in the way we communicate with people. I think for Ponika, sometimes I, we feel fearful that what community wants doesn't meet uh, what's good for the uh, revenue um, generation yeah. to be yeah. very transparent. Uh, have you yeah. had that? Uh, what, what are the key benefits for you uh, going through this uh, open roadmap uh, strategy? Uh, um, so when there is something that the community wants, but the company um, is not going in that direction, um, there can be a couple of outcomes. Um, one, I'm thinking about RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5, when Red Hat, the company, wanted to start getting into virtual machines. And, uh, and so they started traveling down the roadmap of implementing Zen, it's XEN. And simultaneously, the community within uh, Fedora, uh, which, which was kind of upstream, is sort of upstream uh, RHEL back then, started exploring um, KVM. And so within RHEL 5, you had two options for this virtual machine, Zen and KVM. But the truth is that Zen was not community supported. And so if Red Hat wanted to keep supporting Zen to keep implementing it in further release cycles, they had to completely pay for all of the engineers. Uh, they were entirely in charge of the collaboration efforts and the community kept supporting KVM. And as a result, KVM kept getting better and better. And Zen just kind of stayed stale. And after that, you saw that, that Zen went away. <laughs> um, it's still available a little bit here and there. You can still find binaries and whatnot, but KVM is, was clearly the virtual uh, machine of choice. Now, now we're in cloud and everything else, so it's it's past history. But that that's what can happen. But also, the company might make a choice on, say, licensing. Um, the company I'm with right now, Cockroach Labs, um, the Cockroach DB project has a very specific license. That's a business license that the community is kind of, some of the community is not happy with that. And, and the thing is that the company needs to be transparent about why they made that choice. And it, it's because of business purposes, um, has to do with MariaDB. I don't know if you all know about database licensing and it's kind of all over the map. It's not as uh, black and white seemingly as like Apache versus MIT, but, um, but there, there's a lot within the database world, there's a lot more licensing issues and drama and fun stuff. And so the company just had to be transparent. And in this case, you know, they put their foot down and, and that's their choice. And whether or not it will affect future collaborations remains to be seen. I hope not. But it's 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 a choice you make, and sometimes sometimes that line happens. It's scary, right? <laughs> With, you know, I, I, what's so fascinating is uh, you know, when I'm speaking to you is your the passion that you have for open source and the community, and it comes out. I think it just oozes it oozes out of you 
when when it comes to advocacy, how you know, how different do you think those those roles can be between you know proprietary companies like what I you know what myself and uh, and Alex kind of work for these you know corporate corporate uh, you know we have some open source components but you know the uh, the, the main revenue and everything comes from our, our commercial yeah. products and yeah. the the open source yeah how does advocacy differ between between those worlds well does it have to that's the question because. Even within open source, I was employed by a company, Red Hat or Equinix Metal or Cockroach Labs, and those companies still have secrets that they don't want to be made public that are proprietary, that they that gives them an edge within the competition, right? And so to me, a proprietary company is simply making all of their choices secret and um, and paying for their licenses and and et cetera. It's, it's simply a way of working. Um, to me, the difference between proprietary and open source is, I mean, obviously the license, but it's also about how you're doing business. So are those business choices being made in public or are they being made in private? And what can you tell publicly and what remains private? So within proprietary company, you might have more secrets. And I, I have interviewed with uh, Oracle, for example, and I've interviewed with uh, other companies that were more proprietary and less open source. And uh, I think I could have done it. I think I could have been happy. The team was really strong. And, and there was still that element of transparency that I personally need in order to do my style of advocacy. Yeah, I think that makes a, a, a lot of sense. I, I want to, I, I, love, I love the open source uh, community. And I think that there's some great companies such as, you know, who, who a lot of you worked for, you know, HashiCorp in the security world, that actually are proving the model that you can be open source and profitable and, you mm. know, and, and, and a company. You can mix these all together. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not, it's not what a lot of people think that it's kind of black and white, like, okay, like open source is for uh, GitHub and, and you, you know, like and the community takes over and a company is closed source. I think now we're seeing these worlds collide and there's yeah. some visionaries that are doing it really well. You know, I mean, yeah. of course, Red yeah. and, 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 other, and others that uh, kind of lead the way in showing that there's huge benefits in becoming open source. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think talking to people like you kind of, I, 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 you, you really understand the strong community connection that this has where people really get passionate about it. Well, one thing that I want to I want to touch on is a very very at the, at the start you mentioned that you have a bachelor's in dance and a master's in IT. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. well, I'm so curious because I know you've told me before, but you know how did you find this crazy advocacy. world of advocacy in <laughs> in this wild path that you did it, and what and what and why were you attracted to that? Yeah. Um, so when I was you know. 13 and they are like, yeah, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like making you make this choice at age 13, which still, still blows my mind. Um, I was like, uh, let me flip a coin. Yeah. I want to be a dancer. And it was just this random choice. And, uh, and so I interviewed this dance teacher and I was like, um, what does it take to be a professional dancer? What's it like? I asked all these questions. And then right at the end, 13 year old me was like, hypothetically speaking, if someone were say 13 years old and, um, maybe wanted it really bad and took like, I don't know, a ton of classes. Do you think they might maybe be able to be a professional dancer someday? And she goes, without hesitating, no, like this woman was like, no, absolutely not too old. And 13 year old me has not changed at all <laughs> growing up. If someone tells me no, I'm like, oh yeah. And like, I will prove you wrong. 
So, so suddenly I actually did want to dance when I grew up. So I got an undergrad in dance. Um, I went to, before that I went to a private school. I took like five hours of classes a day, Monday through Saturday. It was kind of nutty for such a young person to go so like zero to 110%. And so I wanted I wanted to get an undergrad in dance, dance professionally, get a master's in dance, teach in academia. That was my life. I decided at 13. And uh, and so I did. And and FYI, if you dance professionally in the US, um, you have to have a second and third and sometimes a fourth job. You work 80 to 100 hours a week. Um, it's, it's very difficult. And praise to people who do it still. Uh, but it, when I went back to get my master's um, along the way, uh, by then I was burnt out. Um, but also along the way, I had taught myself HTML. This is the late 90s, early 2000s. And I taught myself HTML so that I could barter for revenue or lighting services or performance spaces. Um, and it never occurred to me that I could be paid to do that. <laughs> uh, so I also waitressed data entry, like anything that I could be paid for in temp. I was a, a receptionist at a tech company when 9-11 happened. And when that second plane went into the building live, my brain said, what if you were a secretary right there, right now? And, and I quit my job. I went back and got a master's in IT because I loved coding. I loved building out websites, but I could not get a job doing it. And back then there were no boot camps. There were, mm. you know, it's a, it's a different world today. I could go to Udemy and get some certificates, but back then you had to have a master's or a bachelor's. It was very strict. Um, so I got a master's in IT that I did not learn anything from. I had taught myself all the things that it it officially gave me a piece of paper. And, and then I did tech during the day and I loved it. Um, of course, <laughs> I mean, I'm here. So when I went to get my master's in dance, my assistantship was to be the web developer of the university. Mm -hmm. And I loved my assistantship and I hated dancing by then. I was completely burnt out. I was miserable. Mm -hmm. Quit dance completely, except for the weekends at clubs. <laughs> and, and that's when I joined Red Hat. That's when I uh, exploded. Now, how do I get to advocacy? I gave birth, <laughs> which I realize that doesn't make sense. But in the Netherlands, when you have a child, you can go to part time and you won't be fired. Mm -hmm. And so I took that time, like maybe I want to be a part time parent. Maybe I want to switch careers. And the job that I had with Red Hat could not be part time. So one of the things I started doing was what do I really enjoy from all the things that I've done? And, and I, I was like, I'll bet I would enjoy speaking at conferences. And of course I get, I get accepted cause I'm a noob and I'm a little quirky and I've got my tech and then I do it and I love it. It's a performance, right? So I'm kind of good at that. <laughs> and and from then on I'm hooked because advocacy is that balance of speaking and coding and meeting people and writing and to me that going back and forth is that is the sweet spot for me it's not too much extrovert it's not too much introvert it's the balance that I I love that is a good story <laughs> it's a great story. <laughs> like, yeah. And we, we saw like everybody pass by, like by Oracle, by the dancing industry and, and <laughs> forward to this point. But uh, I guess this year, this couple of years, you found 2020 and 2021, you've, you've been able to keep on doing uh, that uh, speaking advocacy yeah. online or things have changed radically for you? Um, yeah. So no more travel. 
and that sucks. I, I am really missing my metal tube action, but it's, it's become more streaming and podcasts and, uh, and doing conferences through video. You have to be, you have to like actually think about your background these days and actually think about your mic and your headphones. And, and so it's, it's a different, uh, costume if you will. Uh, but it's pretty much the same. It's still a performance. It's still about the extrovert and the introvert getting out of the cave, coming back to the cave to rejuvenate. Um, so it changed, yes, but not a lot. It's so fascinating to watch you because I can feel your excitement and energy through through here. Yeah, yeah. I want to see you live. I can't wait. Next conference, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. Yay! I mean, anyone just listening to this, they can't see. They can probably still hear your energy, but you're very dynamic. I feel like that's a fantastic skill to have in this in this world because I mean, we can. It can become quite monotonous. It's been down. I'm at yeah. the RSA conference right now, and. Um, you know, and it's some, it can be difficult to, to listen to a session where, you know, it's an interesting set, but there's, there's so many distractions around you that the, the, the speakers have to be very engaging. And I think that's, yes. a, that's a, a very difficult era. Do you, I, and I don't think we're going to go all the way back. I think, I think virtual conferences are going to stay in some capacity. Uh, yeah, forward. agreed. Agreed. So, yeah. We all need to do that. What 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 are some of the skills that you you know learned along the way? Clearly, from your story, you're a, a, a self learner. I think. Exactly. That. <laughs> but what what are some of the skills that you when you kind of went down this role of advocacy that you picked up yourself that you had to hone um, to be able to become such a dynamic speaker and uh, you know and presenter. Well, the, the speaking aspect of it, um, I, I definitely joined Toastmasters so that I would have a place where I could experiment. It's this speaking club that's international, um, and I can't necessarily make mistakes on the stage, you know, when I'm being paid to speak and represent the company or the project or the, the community. But within Toastmasters, within a club meeting, I can test out new humor, new concepts, see if the technical concept I'm talking about is getting across to a non-technical audience. There's all kinds of experimentation that you can do in Toastmasters that you can't necessarily do on the live stage. And to me, that's where I made most of my jumps forward. Um, for example, I discovered that I can never take my shoes off uh, when I speak, because if I take my shoes off, my feet make me start dancing. I, it's just an unconscious, I just start all this, like, you know how most speakers say um and uh and like have these verbal crutches? I have physical crutches where I will start moving unconsciously and it's distracting, you know, like there's, there's, you know, focus Leander kind of thing. But, but I, I discovered that in Toastmasters and therefore I don't take my shoes off during a tech conference unless I want to demonstrate that particular, you know, I used to dance or if it's a little bit fun conference kind of thing, uh, like an unconference, for example. But, but it, it comes down to practicing. And then, and then I will say that I did most of my learning over the past year within the context of COVID, not traveling, and, and I hired a, a life coach and specifically broke down uh, skills that I wanted to consciously focus on, like time management, uh, leadership, communications, uh, very specific. And I went out and, you know, what are the top books for this? What are the top workshops for that? And, and really consciously focused on my learning. Because before that, I would learn according to what the job required. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would learn 
cloud computing, for example, because I was a cloud computing developer advocate, or I would learn um, Python because I was programming in Python as a uh, as a technical evangelist. Um, and as of the past year, I finally got is so the other part of the story is that then I gave birth to twins. And FYI, twins are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and, and suddenly I cared about money so much more. Uh, before that, I just, you know, wanted to be happy in my job. But once I had twins and money mattered and money was tight and there were no more vacations and we were actually going into our savings every month, I suddenly was like, oh, hey, I think I need a raise. And I went and did some research on my income and realized that 50,000 euros a year is severely underpaid within the DevRel space, within the technical space by half or triple. Um, I should have been making way more for my experience. And so I went out and left Red Hat because they couldn't give me that much of a raise. Ended up at Equinix Metal. And after that, I had the extra funds to hire a life coach and make that conscious choice to have extra. Now, you don't need a life coach to kind of consciously pick out things that you want to focus on and focus on them. For me, it was about having someone that I was accountable for that I could be like, this is what progress I've made over the past week, and this is what I'm gonna work on. And that can be a mentor, that can be a friend that is going to push you. It can be, but it, it turns out a lot of friends don't wanna push you, they wanna have ice cream together and they miss you, they wanna hug, but it can, it can be just another person. But that's how I started really moving forward. If you want, I can give you a link, uh, which is, I call it the farmer project because I want to be outstanding in my field. <laughs> Get it? Outstanding in your, the farmer project? Get it? <laughs> um, and it's where I kind of also use a public advocate, like, I am accountable because I've put it out there. Um, and yeah, I find that it, it helps me keep an eye on my own progress as well as having that weekly check-in with my life coach. That's super interesting, but uh, I, it seems like, well, I guess you still have to l keep learning on the coding side. How do you yes. prioritize? How do you organize? How you do how don't you get stressed about the amount of stuff you want to learn from totally totally there's so stress management is one of the things that i was like you know what i need to work on this <laughs> <laughs> so there's so there's learning this little skill it's called saying no um and this other skill where you say what's involved before you say yes mm. and <laughs> And, and what? It's, what? What? I know, I know, not, you know, completely. You make it sound so going, simple. I know, like it just rolls out the tongue. Yeah, it's it's about not saying yes constantly. Um, but also, for example, right now um, in this role that I'm in, I am a Python developer. I have built Python applications, and part of my role is to build applications, and but Cockroach Labs would like to start talking with the JavaScript and TypeScript communities. And so I am learning JavaScript on the job. And that is part of my role. And so I've added JavaScript to, I bought this book, um, Eloquent JavaScript. I love uh, books. I I've love got the, actual I've got this paper. Book. Yeah, uh, this one's great. So <laughs> I, I basically I went out and I was like, hey, Internet fam, um, I need to learn JavaScript. What do you recommend? And this is one of the books. Um, and and so, yeah, it's become part of my job. I put 20 percent. That's one whole day of focused learning on JavaScript. And then 
basically I, I try to work at 80% of my capacity on a day-to-day basis so that when an emergency comes, I have 20% to give, right? If you're working at 100% all the time, emergency happens, that's it. Someone, mm-hmm. Something's going to drop. And then I work closely with my manager and the key stakeholders to be like, if I get more things piled onto my plate, I say, okay, what's the priority here? Because this is what I've got going on right now. And you would like me to add this. How does it fit? What is getting put aside? Um, and so there's there's a lot of just communication and asking questions and making sure that your priorities are aligned with your manager, the team, the company, the yeah. project. Yeah. And, and just... Just no, yet, yet, <laughs> nay. <laughs> I, I think there is something that I find fa- fascinating because I don't think it's clear to everyone. It's like you've been hired for this position uh, and your company you're, you knew that you were not a JavaScript and a TypeScript expert uh, and they needed an advocate for those language and yet uh, they took you in the adventure and that means they understand that the core of your skills is not uh, is not being a, a JavaScript and TypeScript developer. Can you can you? What do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, I I cannot imagine a company hiring someone who is a hundred percent qualified for any position. Like if if another company were to come to me and say, "Hey, I want you to do exactly what you're doing right now, but for us." Even if they added money to that, we would like to pay you double or triple or I would be like, "Mm, no, I'm happy. I'm doing what I love. I'm happy where I am. I'm paid enough. (laughs) You know, so like I'm not going to another company if I'm going to do the exact same thing. So there's that. But two, I have proven that I didn't know Python and I learned Python and jumped into the the Python community, started speaking at different Python conferences and became embedded in that community. I have a proven uh, performance record that I can go, here's where I didn't know it, here's where I did, this is how I joined, these are the steps I did, and this is what I will do with JavaScript as well. now, I also have other skills that complement those. Like I've, I've done developer advocacy and they wanted a developer advocate. I've done the speaking and the writing and the, and the other skills and they also wanted those other skills. Now they, they were taking a chance. They could have gotten uh, someone who was active within the JavaScript, but would they have been as skilled in the developer advocacy side of things? Would they have been as eloquent a speaker? Would they have been able to write as well? That's that's the decision that they have to make. And I'm glad they made it towards me. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yay. Yay. Um, But the thing is, is that I was paid previously to go from zero to a Python developer before. And maybe you don't have that luxury. Maybe you are uh, not even in coding and then you have to do it on the side, teach yourself that on the side. And I just wanted to say that you have to decide if it's important enough to make it a priority. I was once speaking at a Python conference and I was talking about how I was learning Python inhaling it because I was comparing the object-oriented aspect of it to web development and how it was mapping over the language and therefore picking up Python faster. And somebody raised their hand and they were like, yeah, but like my wife just had a kid um, and we're not sleeping and I've got a full-time job and I really want to be a Python developer, but how do I do this? And I said, look, if you can't do this, then you can't. But if you can, and if you're making the time, then you will get there. Mm. It's up to you to make that time or not. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I, to, to all the people out there, you you warned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it is and it's great. It's my experience too as a developer advocate. I work in cybersecurity. I had you know very little experience in this field. Um, you know, going up half uh, you know that that I've had the opportunity to learn, which has been fantastic. Uh, you know, so I think it's for people that want to become an advocate or people that are looking to switch switch jobs. It doesn't matter. You don't need to have the perfect skill set for for it. I, I feel like if you're a self learner and you have other complementary skills, then then that's then that's that's okay. Uh, yeah, we, can, we can build on that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, maybe we turn towards, I, I'm like, I'm super curious and you're so good at sharing your story. Uh, I have like tons of more questions, but it's been 40 minutes and I want to be cautious about your time and our audience uh, availability. So maybe I think, fine, I'm curious because you talked about how you removed barrier, how you're learning through your, through your career, how you adapt uh, and how adapting is such a core skills uh, as a developer advocate. Maybe I'm curious about how do you see, where do you see yourself in five years? Like what's ahead of you? What are the skills you want to learn in the next few years? Do you have an idea or you don't know? How do you gonna, how are you gonna find out? Yeah, so my, I, I tend to answer this. A lot of people think, oh, I want to uh, become a senior in my field and then a manager and then I will be a CEO of my company. No. For me, it's about making the technology world a safe and playful place. Those are my two goals. And if I need to become a CEO to do that, I will. If I need to become a manager, I will. I, right now, I am helping shift towards the curious, the playful, the safe as an individual contributor. And that is enough for me. Um, so in five years, I hope that we have way more people that look like me and are underrepresented. I hope we have more uh, playful, curious uh, makers in our space that are welcomed and embraced and safe. Um, it, that is my goal. Um, yeah, and in 10 years, it's 100%. And, and you know who's the underrepresented group now? The white cis male. And then, you know, I'm done. And then I get to drop the mic and walk away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I feel like uh, Ponycode is very aligned in, in that. Because I, if you go check out all of Ponycode's marketing and, and the videos, and the whole companies are very playful. I feel. Yeah. Alex, I think you heard me. <laughs> yeah. And, but safe as well. Uh, yeah, not only yeah. playful. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was curious what, what playful and safe means for you, really. What's the definition yeah. you're, you cornered? Yeah. So, from a literal child space, um, you can't have fun in a pool that doesn't have a lifeguard necessarily. Mm. Um, or, or if you don't know how to swim, you need to have your swimmies on. So for me, it's in the tech world, it's a space that has a COC, which to me is the seatbelt in the car. It's, it's a space that if something does go wrong, we can fix it. We have the technology. We can make it better kind of thing. It's a certain mindset that comes from curiosity that means that, oh, I want to see what's happening here. But also, I don't want to do harm with what I'm doing here. Um, and so for me, playfulness and safety go hand in hand. Um, if you are just put out in the wild with a knife, that can be fun, but it can also be very unsafe and you can die. And, and there is a certain amount of adrenaline that is inherent in near-death experience, like jumping out of an airplane. I have been there, but there is a level of safety that certain, like some people are more comfortable with and another level of safety that other people are comfortable with. And I'm saying there needs to be a minimum level of safety across the board. 
And there's a certain level of playfulness that people have typically at the beginning of their career that sometimes goes away because of burnout, because of stress, because of not saying no enough or asking what the parameters of the project are. And to me, that can be there your whole life. There's nothing wrong with playing until you're 99.9 years old. Um, and then when you're 100, you better you better yeah. be mature. <laughs> no, but you can play your whole life. It's just that sometimes people think they have to act a certain way or let go of childish things, and that's bullshit. I hope we're allowed to cuss on this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Big fan of cussing. <laughs> no. Cool. No. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's it. So such a great uh a great topic to kind of uh start to wrap up on because i feel like that uh, has led everything throughout the whole program program as this idea of being able to play being able to try be able to fail learn yes. experiment and it's kind of where you've uh how you've ended up down this role um and hopefully had a lot of fun along the way oh yeah yeah <laughs> Learned a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the, 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 I mean, the safe side for me expressed a lot of sustainability. And you said it like to do it all your career long. It means yeah, that you draw a perimeter, that you do it in a safe place. And so you can do it for a long time. I really, I really like it. Yeah, exactly. I'm learning a lot here. This podcast Yay. really feels like my, my listen uh, space. Like I'm learning from this and I'm the first uh, fan. <laughs> <laughs> it's, why, it's why we created it it's because really we just wanted a selfish way to learn but we, we thought we nice. had a chance <laughs> love it I love it thank you very much if people want to le learn more about you where can they find you online I'm on most places as at Rain Leander um, and then I have a personal blog which is Rain.nl, which I realize is very Dutch um, <laughs> I don't know why everyone doesn't know how to uh, speak Dutch. It's not like <laughs> the country is that small. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's because it's where I live, Groningen. Um, and then my name is Rain. But yeah, at Rain Leander in most places. And uh, is there a place that uh, you're speaking uh, at soon? Online or offline? Not yet? That is not yet summer, <laughs> summer there, break there, yeah exactly it's kind of it's the slow we just finished kubecon and pycon uh where i did the booths for both um but oh, yeah wow. yeah we so. wish you some rest <laughs> <laughs> yeah very good mackenzie yeah. where where can people find you online uh, so yeah, you can find me just about anywhere online. Advocate Mac is where uh, is my handle that I use. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best place to, to try and find me. I know it seems old and craggy, but uh, I don't you're, know. you're I such like, an adult. I, I liked my LinkedIn profile, man. Come on. And you're doing something these days. You're following a conference. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if you want to uh, check out the RSA conference, I'm doing daily updates of the RSA. I'm, giving my thoughts on some of the best talks and uh, trying to chat to a few people, which is challenging virtually. But yeah, the RSA conference, uh, follow me and, uh, and uh, follow uh, Git Guardian if you want to see the updates that are coming out from RSA. Cool. Very good. And I'm on Twitter now. I've been forced back <laughs> on Twitter by Mackenzie. So my ID <laughs> is <laughs> Manielgi, M-A-N-I-A-L-G-I-E. That's complicated. Mm -hmm. I need to change that. Maybe, maybe I, I need to put Alexander. It must be available, Alexander, for sure. <laughs> of course. Uh, of course. And mm -hmm. yeah, and Panika Dev for my company's update. And we're we are playful. I'm I'm thinking about changing my role to meme maker, uh, but I don't think my parents would approve or understand. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rain, for for being with us and sharing so much with us. And I hope uh, you get a lot of uh, vanity KPI, a lot of followers from uh, from us. 
a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.